will be part of it. And with this, I give the word to Mr. Mohamed Mabrouk. Oh, thank you very much, Jackie. And uh, I would like first to thank you all for the registration and for the interest. It's a great pleasure having you all here with us. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, the patient who has agreed to donate her body for us to learn from. I'd like to thank Medtronic uh, for the kind support and uh, my colleagues, Ms. Arvin Bashish and uh, Dr. Sharif Mahboub, who are um, dissecting with us. So uh, we will go directly to the uh, dissection. Actually, this is a part of uh, what Jacqueline has just said to you is the endometriosis learning pathway where we are um, having consultants from different European countries. And today we are doing the first uh, cadaveric dissection for this uh, learning pathway. So we'll be pleased to have you with us. And guess what? Our patient has a lot of endometriosis. Let's start. <laughs> Arvind, what would you like to comment? Yeah, okay, well, thank you, Mohammed, and uh, good afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, as mentioned, um, we're grateful for the cadaveric specimen, uh, but certainly you can't guarantee everything. Um, and it looks like yeah. this cadaver has already, in fact, had some laparoscopic surgery to, to the specimen already. So I think that there is some bowel contents that are there. Uh, making things a little more difficult, but no doubt Mohammed uh, and I will be able to work through it. So one good thing is seeing how to cope with degrees of adversity. Um, for those of you who saw the BSGE webinar, um, where, where um, Mohammed did a, a, a dissection, uh, it was key to have the ports in the right place. Uh, and sometimes you can make things more difficult for yourself Sorry, Sharif, with your port um, positioning. So Mohammed is just now starting. Uh, with the congenital adhesions that he's going to be taking down. And Mohammed, is this your usual entry into um, the, the side wall there? Yes, actually, this is uh, our uh, approach usually to the situation in the pelvis. Here, as you can see, there is a bit of a tricky situation with uh, some endometriosis, as you will see as well. And uh, the patient is a bit high BMI, so it's not something that uh, we can choose. It's the patients that we have, and this is the everyday practice. So we start always from the left side, even we know that the left side is always much more difficult than the right one. And this is why we basically start here to free these adhesions and to have the bowel free. So here, as you can see, we are trying to mobilize the bowel without, at the beginning, opening the peritoneum. And we are just trying to find here planes of, let's say, cleavage, where we mobilize the left bowel first to have access to the left pelvic side wall. So scissors, please. Here at that point, we try to open and dissect little by little here the bowel and to mobilize and cranialize the bowel to be able to access the retroperitoneum on the left side. Here, we are just entering the retroperitoneum. And as we will see, our surgery is mainly to find a plane of cleavage between layers of fascia, visceral fascia and the parietal fascia or visceral and visceral fascia. And here, as you can see, we are trying to find a plane of cleavage. And this is actually how we start our surgery for all the endometriosis cases. We start by mobilizing the bowel as much as we can here. And then now, as you can see, we start seeing some anatomy. We need a suction, please, of the pelvis. And here we have a little bit of adhesion. And as you can see here, we are a team. So Sharif, who is my assistant, is trying to show me here that 
we have a bowel that is a bit fused to the pelvic side wall here, and uh, looks like there is uh, maybe a little bit of endo here, maybe. And uh, we will see here how we can manage the situation on the pelvic side walls. So here, moving forwards, we will start again from the left side. So Sharif will move the uterus to the right side. And here on that side, we will try to have an approach to the pelvis because as you can see, we have doors to the retroperitoneum. And as we always try to say, you can open the retroperitoneum at any point, but can I give this to you, Arvin? But there are certain doors to the retroperitoneum. Why? Because we have some spaces, as you will see, virtual spaces in the retroperitoneum. These virtual spaces can be, here please, zoom in. Lateral spaces can be midline spaces. And uh, we will try to access all the uh, spaces as very loud on the pelvic side wall and also the central spaces as much as we can today. So here, as you can see, the uterus, the ovary is falling on the field. So we will try to free the ovaries first. We'll try to free the ovary a little bit on that level. And also on that level here. Good. And when we free the ovary in everyday surgery, what we do is we try either to suspend the ovary or if we are doing a surgery for removal of the uterus, we can just free the ovary from the uterus. And by this, as you will see now, we can just move the ovary from the field. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see well, but Sony, Sony 7, push please the uterus, Sharif. Okay. So what I would do here is I will just show you if we are, for example, doing a hysterectomy, what we will do. So if this patient is planned to have a hysterectomy, what we will do is we will try first to seal, then to cut, and this is the tube. And then we will try to do the same here. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Armin, for the utero ovarian ligament. And then we will seal again the utero ovarian ligament and then cut. So Mohammed, you're using the sealant uh, quality of it and then you're going uh, just the other side of that and cutting on fast. Exactly. Right? So this is an instrument that uses mainly ultrasound energy, not mainly, only ultrasound energy for sealing and cutting. It's actually a new instrument that I have been uh, trying since some time, but I'm starting to like because as you can see, it is using ultrasound energy and by using ultrasound energy, you can do sealing, but at the same time, you can do cutting and dissection. But the mechanism is a bit different from using the uh, energy, the bipolar energy, for example, advanced, uh, advanced bipolar energy for this type of surgery. So if we are doing adnexectomy, then here we can do the cutting of the of the uh, IP ligament and we do the adnexectomy. If not, we can take the tube out and mobilize the ovary this way. If we are conserving and not doing any demolitive surgery, we can just suspend the ovary as you will see on the other side when we start doing the other side. So we're removing it for access now to the, yes. uh, expose the side wall. We are just trying to expose the side wall. And as you can see, we pedunculize here the IP ligament and move the, the ovary outside the field. Why? Because again, if we are doing this type of surgery and we want to access scissors, please, 
the uh, lateral pelvic side wall, we need to have three hands. And as you can see, it's all about traction, counter traction. And now Arvind is helping me by holding the peritoneum at that level, but a little bit more cranial, please. So if you can't see the ureter, Mohammed, what, you go more cranial? Exactly. That's... This is the tip that we were uh, doing today. So if you cannot see the ureter, what you can do is that you go cranial. And here, Sharif is pushing the uterus. Can you please hold this, Arvind? Very much. And then here, we need just to move a little bit to find the ureter. And if you find it, what we need to do is uh, to go, obviously the lady is a bit high BMI and uh, we have a little bit of fat in the retroperitoneum, but again, this is, uh, we cannot select we come and the help patients. Them, right? Yes. Okay, and here we will try little by little to find our plane. What's the aim here? The aim is to say on the peritoneum, can you please lower the uh, suction? Making a lot of noise. And to find the plane of cleavage between the ureter and the rectal planes here. So because we have a lot of fat, we will try, Arvind is pulling, and I am just trying here to find my way to the ureter. But the dissection has an end and has a destination, and this is the ureter. The destination is towards the insertion of the uterosacral ligament. So if we go, and this is a mistake that we all fall in when we start our learning curve, is that we just dig a hole here and we continue to go, go, because it's a very inviting tissue. But actually, this is not what you need to do. What you need to do is to know where exactly your destination is. So our destination is the insertion of the uterosacral ligament. So here we have some adhesions and we will take this. But again, these are this is the access to the lateral side wall. And here, if we have the ureter, on that side, if we go medial to the ureter, and you will see now what we mean by this, we are, this is the rectum, this is the posterior compartment, and now if we are dissecting near the rectum, we are dissecting and opening the pararectal space. And if we are opening the pararectal space, there is an organ that crosses the pararectal space, that is this one, which is the ureter. The ureter divides the pararectal space into medial pararectal space and lateral pararectal space. So, and the, the limit of the pararectal spaces we will see here is the lateral parametrium or the cardinal ligament or the McEnroe's ligament. We will see all these things. But here we want to describe for you a method. We don't want to show you because this is not a movie. <laughs> This is uh, uh, meant for general gynecologists. And as you can in, uh, guess from the title, it is called uh, what a gynecologist needs to know. So here we want to show you a method of doing it so that when you are in your hospital and you're operating a patient, you know how to do this. So look at this here, good traction from Arvind, counter traction from my side, and I'm just swimming here. We swim with the left instrument and we go parallel, parallel, and parallel. And as you can see here, if we go this, we are keeping a visceral patient membrane that's covering the rectum and it is called fascia propria recti. And we are developing this plane and Arvind will take this for me and Sharif will push all the uterus towards Arvind and push, 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 perfect. This way, we find the proper plane of cleavage, which is this one. And then the carbon dioxide will do the rest. All what I need to do is to develop this plane more and more and approach this. And if we are doing an endometriosis surgery, this is a plane that we go 
very frequently, which is called the Holy Plain of Healed. Who is healed? He's a colorectal surgeon, British one. In 1984, he described this TME uh, uh, resection of the rectum. And as you can see, if you preserve, if you preserve, you conserve the fascia properly and do your colon resection for rectal cancer, this reduces significantly the risk of uh, recurrence. And it, here, as you can see, we're just trying to separate one layer of fascia, visceral fascia, from other layer of fascia, which is another parietal fascia. And here, if Arvin goes up, he will pull, pull, pull. And you can see here, this is a plane of cleavage where even if this lady has a lot of fat in the retroperitoneum, we are able to identify this plane. This layer of fascia is called the prehypogastric fascia. And if we have the prehypogastric fascia, what we can do is we lateralize. Yeah. We fact, lat Hamid, this is, there was a question about demonstrating the hypogastric yes. curve, and I think that's exactly what you're just on Perfect. now. Perfect. So we are going well on time, and our colleagues are following. So this is the hypogastric fascia or the prehypogastric fascia, and it is a type of parietal fascia. And look at this. Here, if we concern, if we respect this plane of cleavage, we have the hypogastric nerve sandwiched in this layer of fascia, and it is running here. Here you go, that's it. So I'm very happy that, yes, yes, please, if you hold the fat, Alvin. Yes. Perfect. And here you go. This is the hypogastric nerve, the left hypogastric nerve. This is it. And as you can see, if we just pull it, can you see? It goes up, up, up here to join the superior hypogastric plexus, which is a triangular shaped plexus here situated at the level of the sacral promontory. Look, this is what we start doing. And if you dissect this plane, it is the ureter, this is the medial pararectal space or the so-called Okabayashi space, fine. Respecting this plane, respecting this fascial plane, you don't need even to isolate the nerve because you're doing a non-touch technique. You're opening this space and you will see now how we will approach this deep endometriosis that this lady have here. Opening the rectovaginal space, et cetera, et cetera. However, here, this is a layer where we shouldn't usually, and we don't usually penetrate unless we think that there is, and can you please hold this? Yes, this is the prehypogastric fascia. And if you go here, you will start seeing other types of nerves that are pelvic splanchnic nerves coming from S2, S3, and S4. And these carry parasympathetic innervation and uh, Together with the hypogastric nerve at that level, posterior here, they form the inferior hypogastric plexus, as we will see. Now, a good question. If we want to coagulate or seal the uterine artery at the origin, we have more than one option. Okay, now this is the ureter. We can hold this, not in the ureter, just the meso. Perfect. And as you can see, we are trying to seal, to conserve the vascularization of the ureter as much as we can. And why doing this? Because injury to the ureter during your surgery is not only by cutting it, it's also by burning it, it's also by devascularizing it, more importantly, by devascularizing it. And as you can see here, if we go here, again, for all my colleagues, it's not how we want to show or to demonstrate to you. We want to show you a method. And the method is, look, we swim. We deal with the retroperitoneum in that way. We just try to separate one layer of fascia from the other. We swim. And now we go, as my friend uh, from India, Shalesh Puntambaka, always says, we go parallel, parallel, and parallel. We go here, parallel to the ureter. And as you can see, ureter is here. We want to go parallel to the ureter. Now, can I see the ureter, please? Perfect. We will continue to isolate the ureter till its entry. And I'm serious. Here, there is a lot of, can you feel this, Arvin? The yeah. tissue is a bit hard. 
Yeah. And apparently this lady really had deep endometriosis, which is a surprise, but it's a good surprise. <laughs> okay, so what we can do is here, as you can see, we rotated the Maryland. We go here, parallel to the ureter, and thank you, Arvin. Arvin is doing me a fantastic counter traction, and I start going here. And here, we the only thing that starts to cross the uh, here you can see and you appreciate these are the branches of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. And if Arvin shows you, can you see this? This is the obliterated umbilical artery, and we're just pulling on it. And in 40% of the cases, when you see the origin of the anterior, the uh, yes, please, the obliterated umbilical artery you will find the origin of the uterine artery here at that point. And this is what we do to identify the uterine artery and the, at the origin. And I'm sure the question here is about this. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, Mohammed, so there were two questions. So what, one question is about the hypergastric nerve and how far do you need to kind of dissect or how deep do you need to go? I mean, sure. you were talking about the no touch. So in, sense, in essence, knowing that it's here means that you don't need to entirely skeletonize it. Yes. But, um, in terms of the depth, what, what would you say? Sure. So here, it depends on what we will be doing. Right. Because obviously, if we are aiming at doing, for example, massive radical excision of endometriosis, parametrial, and we are doing, for example, here, segmental bowel resection. So I need to, yes, have this. Yes, have the hypogastric nerve is not my aim, actually. My aim is to identify the nerve, to identify the fascia, and be medial to the fascia. So every time there are macroscopic and microscopic variations in the anatomy of the hypogastric nerves. So if I go to isolate nerve by nerve, I'm not sure if I will injure one of these nerves. If I use bipolar, for example, here, and uh, or any type of energy, ultrasound, whatever energy, and I can injure this nerve. The problem with the hypogastric nerve as well is uh, again, the inferior hypogastric plexus where you can find here that inferior hypogastric plexus, it carries both sympathetic and parasympathetic. And more importantly, the parasympathetic innervation is uh, extremely important to conserve. So if the question is, if I can save this, lateralize this and medialize the pathology here, then, I'm sure that I'm away from the ureter and I'm away from the nerve, fine. Do we, after seeing the nerve enveloped in its fascia, as you can see here, so this is a fascia, this is a fa visceral facial envelope, this is the nerve. Shall I then skeletonize it and prepare it like this? Yes, if I'm operating on a cadaver, yes. If not, why should I? You know what I mean? Yeah. So here, this is, I, this is usually the depth of dissection that I do for posterior deep infiltrating endometriosis. However, if I am doing now a segmental bowel resection, I would be very much interested to do this. And I will also put a swab. Can I have the suction, please? So we will do some cleaning here. And Mohammed, while you're doing that, so here, I mean, your so landmarks to be careful of is actually kind of going too medial towards the rectum. And as yes. you've said, that really we've got no business going exactly. lateral to the hypergastric yes. nerves unless we actually are dealing with parametrial disease around here. Exactly. Which now, inevitably does cause some disruption to the nerves there. And now we will prepare the parametria and uh, we will also see what I mean by this. Can I just give you this? Another tip that I learned, and I will, I will be happy to moment. share this with you is when we start preparing this polyplane, you always want to make sure that you are doing the right thing on both sides. So I prepare this and I'm now, there is also a very important structure here. We will speak about this, okay? And what we will do is we will put a small ghost, a small swap inside. And this swap, we will keep it inside and I do this 
in a systematic methodological way in all of uh, the surgeries that I have to open this space. Why? Because now I know where I am. And if I open from the other side, I open from the other side, all the structures that are medial to this ghost are medial, are, uh, are structures to go with no problems. All what's lateral, I know that it is, even if I'm distracted, I shouldn't go here, okay? Now, coming back to what we did so far. If we are moving, removing the uh, uterus, or we are moving the adnexa, or, or, or what we will do is that we will consider the uh, mobilization of the ovary as you have seen this way. And then if we are conserving, then we will open. If we're doing an endometriosis surgery, like in this case, for example, we open medial to the ureter, medial to the IP ligament, we identify the ureter, and then we identify the spaces. We identify the medial pararectal space, the lateral pararectal space, and then we start little by little digging here. Mahali, just before we uh, yes. carry on, so two things for us to be mindful of, questions yes. that have come in. Uh, somebody wanted to know about the superior vesicle yes. artery and the variations, um, and in fact, the uterine artery variations coming off the no, internal no. iliac. So maybe we can have a look at the uterine artery. Sure. And then the second question in the back of our minds is about when do you sacrifice the hypogastric nerve? M my answer to that would be, as infrequently as possible. And if it has to happen on one side because you have deep parametrial disease, yes. then you'd be very careful to preserve it on the other side. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, Arvin. And this is again here. We can see that we have, usually we have, we have all learned that the water runs under the bridge and the ureter goes under the uterine artery. Here we can see we are conserving the maso ureter, and this is very, very important, as we said, for the vascularization. Here we can see that this is the hypogastric, this is the obliterated umbilical artery. And then we are starting now to find or to figure out where the origin of the uterine artery is. Maybe. Here I can see something, and this is, yes, please, if you put some pressure here, Arby. Perfect. It's very small, but the lady is also menopausal apparently, and this can be a small uterine artery. We'll just dissect it. I'm not sure if it is, but it looks like it is because here we did, yes, and this should be the uterine artery. In 60% in, in of the cases, this is what happened, which means that the anterior division of the internal iliac artery finishes this way. We have the uh, obliterated umbilical artery. We have the uterine artery. The uterine artery crosses here above. And obviously, as you can see, this is the so-called ureteric tunnel, if we would like to call it like this. And this tissue, and this is very important now, what we start saying, if you please medialize the ureter. Here, as you can see, this is a connective tissue. And this connective tissue connects. Connects what? Connects the visceral fascia that is uh, surrounding the uterus, the cervix, and the vagina to the visceral fascia that is the parietal fascia that's covering the wall. And this is the called the parametrium. It depends obviously on the level. And can you see here? We start seeing these nerves that I was speaking about. And here, if this is the lateral parametrium, we go under the ureter, we will see the uterine vein. Which uterine vein? The superficial uterine vein, which can be here. Here you go. And the superficial uterine vein is important, but the more important one is the deep uterine vein. Why the deep uterine vein? Because it is in the paracolpus or the lateral part. The lateral part, there are a lot of nomenclatures, there are a lot of systems to name the things here. But as you can see here, we have a part which is a vascular part, which is the, the lateral parametrium or the paracervix is divided by this ureter into two parts. A part that is uh, here, divided by the ureter and above the ureter. And here, this part, which is, uh, as you can see, containing and very, very close to the joining of the, of the hypogastric nerve with the pelvic splanchnic nerves, 
to form the inferior hypogastric plexus. And the landmark for this is the deep uterine vein. The deep uterine vein, we shouldn't actually, if you're doing, I don't know, I'm not an oncologist, but my, my uh, uh, training and my education in oncology, when I uh, was doing some, is uh, when you find the deep uterine vein, this is where you, this is the posterior end or the posterior landmark for your parametrectum. You shouldn't go neither posterior nor lateral because what you will do is uh, you can injure the inferior hypogastric plexus, which you find here. So coming back to us, and again, this is for what a gynecologist needs to know. You need to know how to isolate the ureter in a safe way. That's very important. You need to know, yes, how to secure the uterine artery at the origin in a safe way. Why? Because if we have, for example, a big fibroid, a, 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 a broad ligament fibroid, something like this, and you're doing even a hysterectomy, it's important that you clip or you manage the uterine artery at the origin. If you're doing a radical surgery, to do prepare the parametrium either for parametrectomy for endometriosis or for uh, uh, radical hysterectomy for cervical cancer, you need to prepare this. You need to prepare the parametrium and you need to know which is the part that is uh, vascularis or vasculosa or the part that is uh, that is uh, uh, could be sacrificed and the part that should not be sacrificed under the deep uterine vein here. So if this is the lateral parametrium, and obviously here, as Arvind was saying, if we are about to sacrifice and we have bilateral parametrium, we should choose one to operate on, and we should definitely, or at least this is the school that I have learned at, to save one, because obviously taking both, this means uh, destruction of both the autonomic nervous uh, central stations for the pelvis. Why? Because out of this inferior hypogastric plexus, we, there is a penetration. These nerves penetrate the hypogastric fascia again and go to innervate the bladder, go to innervate the genital organs and go to innervate the rectum. We have some questions. So I have two, two or three things. One, um, yes, in terms of the, um, the, the depth of our dissection, clearly if we were doing a TLH, Yes, uh, we wouldn't be kind of dissecting this deeply, no. um, but for deep infiltrating endometriosis, we do. Um, there was a question about asking different approaches to the uterine artery. Yes, um, whether you have a set way of uh, doing it, or whether you kind of, uh, when you're approaching the uterine artery, do you look for your landmark of the uh, obliterated vessel first? How do you approach the well, uterine artery? That's a very good question, and all the questions are very good, actually. <laughs> But what I want to say is, uh, this is one of the approaches for the uterine artery that I, I like. Obviously, we can open directly on the uterine artery. We can open on the uterine artery after identifying the obliterated umbilical artery, opening a window in the medial border of the broad ligament, identifying the ureter, finding the uterine artery, clipping the uterine artery. I like this. However, also, I would like to remind you that uh, in some cases, we need to. Uh, especially in obstetric cases where you need to identify the, the bifurcation of the uh, common of the iliac vessels. So here, for example, you start seeing and appreciating the external iliac vessel here at that point. Okay, let's let's do the external and okay. Then after seeing this, you will see the internal. And when seeing the internal, you can start doing the stepwise devascularization. For the, uh, for the postpartum hemorrhage. And for stepwise devascularization, it's important that you also know that uh, here, can, can you please hold this? Uh, we have to save uh, the posterior division of the internal iliac artery. So we have, if we have to coagulate or seal or, or, or uh, suture or anything like that, we have to be very careful because the posterior division uh, suturing the posterior division can devascularize the gluteal area, which is not a very uh, nice complication to have. So here, as you can see, 
This is the external iliac artery. This is the internal iliac artery. And at about two centimeters from the bifurcation, you appreciate here that this is the bifurcation. And this is where we can, after two centimeters caudally, we can, this is the origin of the posterior division. And this is where after this, we can ligate the, here, the internal iliac or the hypogastric here. So Mohammed, if people are kind of wary of opening, for example, over the bifurcation, potentially you'd say go into a familiar place and work your way back. Yes, but you can also do it anti-grade. You can open here. If you open, if you go near the round ligament, cut, identify the um, obliterated umbilical artery, go here as if you're going towards the pelvic side wall, open this, tick, 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 you will find the uterine artery. So this is an anterior approach. This is a posterior approach. This is a direct approach. A direct approach is that you open directly on the, uh, um, on the uterine art. My advice is uh, please don't keep this opening till for the first time when you have a, a bad situation. If you can do it when you have a relaxed situation, please do it. And this is obviously there are some schools. I have some friends here from Rome from uh, Italy and uh, uh, with us today. And there are some schools in Italy, they do the uterine artery at the origin for all the hysterectomies. Why? Because they believe that obviously if you do this while uh, you're relaxed, if you have a situation while you are having a difficult situation, then you can definitely manage. I say maybe this is a little bit excessive, but if you can do this, with a little bit of a difficult situation, then yes, you please ask your consultant or ask your colleague, senior colleague to give you a hand and then do this in a situation where there is a small fibroid, a big fibroid, anything like this in an elective situation, rather than facing this for the first time in a severe hemorrhage or in a difficult situation. I'm, I'm okay, then. What were you doing there, Mohammed? Just kind of like skeletonizing yes, this is, the- this is the, internal iliac artery, this is the anterior division, this is the posterior division of the internal iliac artery. And this is why I was saying, try to avoid this. And if you want to clip, to seal, to do whatever, do it here and not here. Okay, that's nicely shown there, nice. Okay, while we are here, we can also open some more lateral spaces. So guys, I hope that we are not confusing uh, you so again at next mobilized lateral side wall open ureter identified ureter is very important to identify then we identified the ureter we started preparing the spaces and again my role here is to give you a method traction counter traction sorry for the repetition but traction counter traction finding the fascia proper recti finding the pre hypogastric fascia opening this plane and then going laterally and then finding the ureter, finding the uterine artery at the origin and the obliterated umbilical artery and all the branches of the uh, uh, internal iliac artery. Then, as we are here, we can also open the paravasicular spaces. And here, can I have the Sony 7, please? Mohammed, sorry, just before you finally move on to the next yes? um, door, um, somebody also has asked about. Um, getting to the uterine artery, yes. just moving lateral to the uterosacral ligament. M my perspective on that would be you end up coming to a, a lot, a lot uh, across a lot of uh, colla hazardous collaterals. Yes. And I wouldn't try and seek out the uterine artery that way, but um, perhaps a bit higher up. What, what would you say? I agree because here again, either you open up, you do a posterior approach, either you go down and you do an anterior approach, or you open on the broad ligament, but not here. I open here if I have to open directly here okay. at that point, because I'm not very much, I know that other colleagues just open here and dissect, but I've been taught that it's not good. And I've been actually privileged. And I want to thank them all without names, because if I start saying names, I'm not finished tonight of my uh, teachers and my, I have been privileged to learn from very, very, very good teachers and I am thanking them all. 
The point is that I have been taught not to dig a hole in the retroperitoneum. So if you dig a hole here, near here, and moving here or there, it starts to bleed, and here there is a knotty plexus of veins, then you will not be in a very good position because you don't know where the ureter is, you don't know where that, and you start coagulating, and you're not very happy. So I have been taught to open and to enlarge the spaces and expand, and that's it. So here for the lateral, for the paravasical, so here we open the pararectal, the posterior lateral spaces. This is the bladder, and these are the area. This is the area that is around the bladder. Uh, this is the area that's around the bladder, and the area around the bladder we call paravasical area. So the paravasical area we can open here, and the door to the paravasical area is the round ligament. And as you have seen here, we moved the IP ligament, we opened around the IP ligament. Here the door is around the round, around the round. And you can see here, we are sealing. And then how lateral or medial do you go with it? Do you have another landmark? That's a very good idea. Thank you very much, Alvin. So if I'm doing a, a hysterectomy, a straightforward hysterectomy, we cut between two thirds and one third, because this will give us direct access to the anterior leaflet of the, of the broad ligament and will take us directly to the uh, here. Push, please. Uh, okay. It will take us here, actually. But here, because I want to open, it's like as if I'm doing a uh, opening for an oncological case where I need to open the paramazical space and dissect, which is a bit different from opening for a straightforward hysterectomy. So here, I'm opening very lateral, not very, very, but yes, a little bit lateral. If I'm doing a lymphadenectomy on an oncological patient, I would also open here, cut the round ligament here, here. But here, this is not what actually I'm aiming for. But what I would like to say is take care of the round ligament. Round ligament has an artery called Samson artery without P, Samson, S-A-M-S-O-N. -S <laughs> and it is an artery that sometimes is nasty, especially if you're using an instrument that you're not used to use. You just coagulate or you cut, and this retracts here. And when it retracts here, the round ligament is, is actually not round and not a ligament, anatomically speaking. <laughs> but it escapes here in the deep inguinal or this triangle or this retroperitoneal space that is called Bogros space or the lateral retropubic space of Bogros. Here, it's not, if you're not very familiar with this space, and I'm not seeing because I heard someone saying, I'm saying this because I had a colleague who, uh, Yes, a, a registrar who opened this and uh, sealed, cut the round ligament without proper sealing. And as you can see here, we are just using this round ligament to do some traction. And uh, if we can, yeah, we will now, Arvind is kindly trying to help me to see the, my anatomical landmark here is that in the paramazical area, which is the obliterated abnormal artery, which is this one. So I'm not, I know very well my destination now. And I want to go here to the obliterated umbilical artery. Why? Because it will make a big difference what I am doing here. Perfect, thank you, Arvind. So if I'm doing an oncological case or if I'm looking after the nerves, et cetera, I will go here in the lateral part of the space. And uh, opposite, please. Yes. Because here we need to find where the obliterated umbilical artery is, which is this one. If you please hold it for me, Arvin. Yes. Perfect, perfect. And we can see it here. And then we will go lateral to the IP, to the obliterated umbilical artery. And this will be our anatomical landmark. And you will see in a minute, we will open the uh, la lateral part of the space and we will be seeing important structures here. Okay. I left this because many times if I mobilize the ovary like this, I need to suspend the ovary and I would like to show this to you at the end if we have time. So here I like to, yes, because this ovary can also be 
ported. Yes. Okay. Now our our direction is. Uh, towards the lateral side wall here. Can I see here, please? Sorry. Okay. Yes, here, a little bit deeper, please. Perfect. So this is the lateral part of a Zyker space. And as you can see here, here we have the obturator internus muscle. And if we go a little bit deeper, again, by swimming, this is the obturator internus muscle. This is it on each fascia. And here we will look for the obturator lymph nodes, either superficial or deep lymph nodes. And we will definitely find the obturator nerve. So again, our dissection here, if we are doing, as you can see here, this is the obturator nerve. This is the obturator nerve. And it is just finding anatomical landmarks, knowing exactly where we are. And this is runs on the obturator internus muscle to go here with together with the obturator vessels through the obturator canal. And there's a question about Yabuki space. Yes, we will prepare the Yabuki space. I don't know. The name is very attractive. <laughs> And there is no, no time, no single time that we did any cadaveric dissection except for the colleagues asking for the Yabuki space. <laughs> Yabuki space is called also the fourth space. And we will see now that if we remove these lymph nodes, if I give you please these lymph nodes, Arvind. Yes, this is the external iliac vein. And again, if we are, we are, our role here is to separate fascia. This is a good plane of cleavage. There are a couple of questions on sciatic nerve and uh, sacral nerves, but I think that we'll be coming on to those yeah. potentially later at the end. Absolutely. Uh, bearing in mind, we're trying to keep much of this as, as valid for the general gynecologist. There was a separate question. With a pleasure. Asking about saying whether a general gynecologist should be. Um, a clipping the uterine artery at its uh, origin. Uh, and my kind of feeling is that it's if you feel comfortable and confident doing those Thank things. You, and much of this is about an evolution in your surgical practice. So there's no reason why general surgeon, general gynecologist couldn't do that. But you've got to be familiar with the anatomy. Yes. And again, the general gynecologist, we, we opened this, we did a laparoscopy for this case, no? It's true that we haven't uh, uh, we we haven't done an ultrasound or MRI for her, but if you find, for example, a situation where you have a, a fibroid that is in the broad ligament, and you are confronted with this, and you were supposed to do, can you please hold this, yeah, and you were supposed to do this as a hysterectomy. Yes, obviously you can do. The, uh, the uh, uterine artery normal as intraperitoneally. However, you cannot guarantee and you can be in a big trouble by having this bleeding or having the ureter in the middle. So the question is, uh, unfortunately, we are not, we do not receive any training for the retroperitoneum and this is why uh, let me just tell you that except for perforating the bowel and uh, most of the other complications that we do as gynecologists are in the retroperitoneum. So ureteric injury, vascular injury, and all the important injuries actually are in the retroperitoneum. So my question is, this is a place where more than 80% of the complications that a gynecologist does can you please hold this, Arvind? Yes, very good. I'm not intending here to do a lymphadenectomy, but I my intention is to clear and clean this area just to show more anatomy here. So if the point is we don't receive training for this, unfortunately, and during your specialty training, no one does teach you how to secure the uterine artery at the origin, 
And this is the point. Then you come to the conclusion saying, yes, but a general gynecologist doesn't need, doesn't or shouldn't. Okay, so if you have a difficult hysterectomy, what would you do? Yes, I understand that we all can pray and close our eyes and say, fine, you know what? I'm doing it here. I'm closing it. But it's not always the way to do surgery. So, yes, if we need to do something, it's much better that we learn how to do it and how to do it safely. And again, we absolutely, I definitely believe, definitely, that uh, retroperitoneal anatomy and securing the uterine artery and the origin, isolating the ureter, is fundamental, is not optional in the training of a general gynecologist. So if this is the question, my answer to this question with big certainty is absolutely yes. The general gynecologist should, it's not optional. And again, yes, please, can I have it? This is in many, uh, the American, the ACOG in 2018, they started implementing some years ago, retroperitoneal anatomy in the teaching of the uh, gynae residents. So yes, maybe you will not do a lymphadenectomy. Yes, I agree with you. But you will need at one point in any situation of difficulty in uh, intraperitoneal surgery, even if I was doing, uh, and I have a lot, loads of videos, and myself and you, Arvind, we were doing a, uh, can, I, can I give you this, please? And I've next to me on Friday, you know? Yeah. And we were expecting to do salpingo orthorectomy, which is actually not, shouldn't be a very big surgery or a very difficult one. But the patient had a cyst that was all developed in the retroperitoneum and probably she had previous uh, PID and we had to isolate the ureter and we had to take all the thing retroperitoneally. And then yes, it wasn't a very easy job. So Mohammed, there's a question about what your dissecting now, and this is, you're, we're getting off the fatty obturator nodes to try and just clean up the yes. anatomy here. Is exactly. that correct? Yes, yes. So here we are not aiming at, again, doing a lymphadenectomy. We are just clearing, uh, and yes, why not? We are doing, a lymph, pelvic lymph clearance as a part of what we believe will let us see a little bit of more anatomy, a little bit of spaces, and also the parametrium and the book is space so that we can answer to the questions that my colleagues were asking. So here, this is the left pelvic side wall. And here, I will just show you two, three things quickly. Okay. Please, Arvind, if you hold this pelvic nodes, these external iliac lymph nodes, we will, yes, again. Good, perfect. So here we, let's recap. We open the pararectal spaces, medial and lateral. We open the lateral parabasical space. We open the, the so-called obturator fossa, even if this is not a good anatomical terminology. And we will go here to this space, which is the iliolumbar space for my colleagues who were asking about the nerves. So iliolumbar space is a space between the psoas muscle and the external iliac vessel. So if, if uh, yes, Arvin, please. Now you have seen the obturator nerve. Here we aim at dissecting little by little, arriving to find here the lumbosacral trunk, okay? And uh, lumbosacral trunk is uh, L4, L5, S1, S2, then joins other branches coming from S2, 3, and 4 to form the sciatic nerve. So, and here, this is the lateral approach to the sacral plexus and to the roots of the sacral plexus and the sacral nerves here at that point. Why am I saying lateral? Because there is also a medial approach, as we can see here from the other side, 
where we can penetrate the prehypogastric fascia and find ourselves on there. I'm sure that you can appreciate that there are very big veins crossing here. I'm not a neuropelviologist. I don't do this every day in my practice, but this is anatomy. So if uh, you're not a neuropelviologist and you, you want to do it in a cadaver like myself, please do. If you want to just give it a go on a patient, please don't. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm showing the, uh, we need to go more cranial here to find the lumbosacral trunk, to be honest with you. Yes, especially here. But again, yes. Can I have the suction, please? It would be easier on a thinner patient, of yes. course, but I think you've identified it just yes. over here, Mohammed. It is, yes. It is what I want, what I want to say is this space, we open it. We open it when we do lymphadenectomy to identify the uh, perforators and to be able to do superficial and deep obturator lymph nodes in a better way, yes. We do it, we, operate, we open it and we dissect it when we do decompression of the sacral nerve roots, as you can see here, the iliolumbar space. And if we bring the swab and put it here to absorb a little bit of lipias, a little bit of this liquid, and then we will be able to identify- Let's put another swab down. Yes, please. Clean that. I'll just put a swab down. Yes, first, please. So coming back to what we were doing, any questions I, 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 that I didn't answer yet? Okay. Can I have the Maryland and the Sony 7, please? Let's clean the scope, please. Okay, so yes, let's clean the scope. Thank you. Oh, it's not very clean. I have to say that I here, I also feel privileged to do this dissection in the Griffin Institute here in London. It's a marvelous place. And uh, I have to say that they are all very collaborative. And I am also operating with uh, my fantastic scrub nurse, Chris, who is doing me a fantastic assistance, to be honest. And this is not obviously the first time, but I'm very, very thankful and grateful. So here we will leave this for a second. We will put it in the iliolumbar space. And okay, lymph nodes away. And uh, voila. So the remaining space that we haven't done in the Chris, can I give you that, please? In the uh, paras, paravasical area is uh, the medial paravasical space. And now Arvind will kindly hold this for me. And why do we open the medial paravasical space? Because if we have, and today, yes, we, we had a fantastic dissection with my colleagues here for deep endometriosis, and we injected something that you will be surprised when you see it published soon because it simulates the deep endometriosis and uh, it actually helps very much for the... So if, if we are doing this, if we have a bladder nodule, and please Arvind hold here, a big bladder nodule, what we aim at is, we aim at going to this space. Mohammed, can you tell us a little bit about the landmarks here and if people are fearful of ureters, people are fearful of the bladder, how sure. do you approach this uh, dissection to keep Perfect. the bladder safe? Perfect. So what I do is parallel, parallel and parallel. So I open parallel to the round ligament as we will do here, for example. So, okay, can you please move the uterus to the other side? Super. Can I, can I just try it this way? Perfect. So here, this is the round ligament. Can I give it to you, Arvin? Good. I have a nodule, a big nodule of endometriosis here. Fine. I want to open here. I go to the door. The door is round ligament. I am a bit autistic in doing these things. I do it and I do it every time and it's the same. 
I open around the round and I go parallel, parallel and parallel. Then I am sure that 99.9% .9 I'm safe here. And obviously if I have any doubts, I will feel the bladder, perfect. And then my target after this is to identify the obliterated umbilical arch. In the cadavers, it's not as easy as in uh, live patients, but with some traction, yes, we can take these adhesions actually. Yes, but it's not important. What we need to do is, yes, just a moment. Yes, perfect, perfect. Then, yes, then. yes, perfect. If you keep it like this, please. Yes, please, thank you. No, I need the Maryland, please. Yes. Okay, voila. So I open and I usually open a big hole. It's not a small one. I open and then I find this. And when I find this, I'm done. This is the second anatomical landmark. Then I don't have to go this way. I have to go this way, medial to the obliterated umbilical artery. And I, when I do this, I know that if I go this, and this is what we, I hope my colleagues today have enjoyed this as well, because it's not only where to start, it's very, very important to have in your mind where to go. So can you see here? We go, this is our destination, midline, vesicle uterine uh, reflection. This is our destination. Midline, vesicle uterine reflection. Et voila. And I go on the cervical fascia, the visceral fascia that covers the, and I go lateral to medial. This is extremely important. If we have any pathology in the midline, like a bladder nodule, for example, we go lateral to medial. Why? Because we will circumscribe the nodule. And here you go. This, this is something that I try always to, I will not open the vesicle uterine space because we still need to inject some stuff here. But here you go. This is, okay, obviously here we will then mobilize and we can open the red space. Please the uterus. And this is why, I, I don't know if I answered the question, Arvin. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And also just following those landmarks and how to kind of just keep. So you mentioned also potentially having to fill the bladder if you weren't sure Absolutely. about the bladder edge. Absolutely. And you showed the entry point. Yes. And here, if we go here and follow this champagne sign, we follow this avascular loose area virtual space, we are done. So look. It is not my opinion, and as I always say, this is an Austrian anatomist called Paul. He, he described a law called patient law of facial fusion, and this is in 1928. There are layers of fascia, there are layers that if you just find the plane between them, you just, you don't need to do anything at all. Look at this. We just, oh, this is important. Now we are starting to get inside the retropubic space. Retropubic space, we can approach it if there is no pathology here. But here, as Arvin was just saying, it's very, very important to know where to cut because you can cut inside the bladder. However, with a good traction, you cut in the midline. Okay, we need this space, yes. Why do we need it? Because we need to mobilize the bladder. If you have a big lesion, big uh, endometriosis lesion of the bladder, you can open the retrous space or the retropubic space this way. Then you have the bladder, exactly. Look how Arvin kindly helped me to open this space and to dissect here and voila, voila, fine. Here, what you need to do, you need to remember that. If we are here at that plane, retropubic, if you go down, remember that there is an important venous plexus, as you can see, called venous plexus of Santorini. This is not a very good uh, situation when it, when it bleeds because these veins retract and they start making you unhappy. Then if you move lateral, 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 here, this is another space that I was speaking about, the bog rose space. And here, if you do a lymphadenectomy, the lymphadenectomy is usually has its own landmarks where to stop your lymphadenectomy. And here it's the deep circumflex iliac vein. 
But if you look here, if you please hold this, Arvin. Perfect. This is the external ILEC system. This is the obturator system. And here you can see a little bit of venous connection between the external ILEC system that goes down, down, down here. It's a bit very, very uh, flattened, but it is, we can see it, we can feel it here. And this connection between this one, this small one, this one, this one connecting there here and going here, 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 up here, is called the corona mortis. Uh, who described this? Our orthopedic colleague. Thank you very much, Arvin. Yes, Arvin is helping me to show it better to you. Perfect, perfect, yes. Our, vascular, our orthopedic colleagues described it as corona mortis, connecting the external ILEC system to the obturator system. And when it connects the external ILEC system to the obturator system, if you're doing a dissection of the lymph nodes, it's there. You don't have any problem in cutting it and bleeding from it. But if there is a fracture of the pelvic bone, the fracture of the pelvic bone, can simply uh, uh, cause significant bleeding from this corona mortis. And obviously for the orthopedic surgeon to arrive to secure hemostasis here, this is a very tough tissue, tough task. Do we have other uh, uh, questions here? Yes. Iliopectineal ligament is here. Yes. That's more lateral than you'd normally go with a cold pose suspension. Uh, it's actually up Absolutely. here where Please, we normally Arvin, go. This is your area of expertise. Okay, so Good. Can, can I just see here? Retrofery, thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, so this is here the bladder. This is actually the level of the reflection of the bladder. And here, if we, yes, perfect. And if I can have so this. Mohammed, just before we move on to this side, so yeah. then if somebody's doing a straightforward TLH, yes. Um, and we've obviously gone quite lateral on the round ligament. But yes. if they were doing a straightforward TLH, um, yes. where, where would you kind of start to start bringing let's down do your... Let's do it here. Let's do it yeah. here. So let's just free these adhesions. Yes, please. Good. There was also a question about using clips on the uterine artery and whether there's any particular tips or tricks for that, yes. or do you believe yes. in using those? Perfect, yes, I, I, I surely do this when I'm doing temporary closure of the uterine artery. So if you're doing, for example, a big myomectomy or something like that, and you want to devascularize the uterus, looks like a hernia actually, and you want to devascularize the, the uterus, then yes, the uterine artery, you can just clip it at its origin. We use clips, yes, metal clips, not the bulldog ones. And these metal clips, we use them. Can we clean the spoke, please? We use them, and the tip here is not to close them strongly, just closure, but not very strong closure, because at the end of the surgery, you just hold them, remove them, and it's amazing. So that was the query. The tip is not to close them fully if you yes. want to be able to take them off easily. Absolutely. So here, if on the right side, we need to do a straightforward hysterectomy, good. Here. Help me to do that. Thank you. Pushing Thank you, in there really on the uterus. Thank you. Yes, this is a very thin round ligament. But here, I would I would cut here, two thirds and one third. Here, why? Because this will take me directly to the anterior leaflet of the broad ligament, where I will go directly here at the level of the. Vaginal cup, and will take me. Look, the vaginal cup is here. Push, please. Uh, uh, sure, sure. Yes, it's here. Perfect. So cut the round ligament, cut here, and in one minute you're here. Because if you cut very, very close to the uterus, then you will have to go to change your direction, and this will take you time and energy. If you cut very distal, this is also a situation again where you do no problems at all. 
but you do it when this patient needs a uh, an oncology or lymph node clearance, as you have seen on the other side. This is just a hernia that we will just move away. Perfect. Yes, and I'm not sure if this is what we need to do. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, okay. Just to recap, we did on that. I'm sorry, the quality of the situation here is not perfect, but I'm sure that you appreciated on the left side the uh, the the, thing, the things that we have realized to see. So here we can just yes, as we said. Apparently there is an element of endometriosis here. We just, yes, please Arvind. Yeah, perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. And as you can see here, this is all a teamwork. And uh, I happily work with my colleagues, Arvind and Sharif always. And this is why even without saying that my life is made very, very easy. Oh, let me just show you one thing here. So now this is perfect. Thank you very much, Arvind. So here, this is, uh, Let's imagine that we will do an adnexectomy here. I'm not speaking about any instrument, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, if we use our instrument, if any instrument, now you know that there is this lovely number of seven, every ceiling instrument is done to do seven. Vessels, millimeter, vessels up to seven millimeters, fine. If we now do this, with, for example, an instrument, but we put a huge amount of tissue saying, yes, this infundibular pelvic ligament actually is less than seven. That's true. But look at the amount of tissue that you're taking around the infundibular pelvic ligament. This is definitely more than seven. And the point is uh, the impedance of the tissue that's around, peritoneum, fat, etc., etc., is different from the impedance of the vessel. So what you can do is, uh, you can skeletonize a little bit the vessel. And as you can see here, we made a window. We made perfectly a window that will, yes, will make our life safer. Why? Because we know that the ureter is here. And we know that if we come here, we will use this for feeling. And one of the tips that I learned with the ultrasound in general without using bipolar is you seal then you move two to three millimeters and one millimeter out and then you seal and cut look here you achieve good sealing and you have one millimeter here in case you're not very satisfied this doesn't slip this doesn't go away because if it goes away inside the or behind the peritoneum, this is not a good situation. Then, obviously here, we mobilize the cecum. We usually try to mobilize the cecum before, but here the, we, we didn't, we didn't touch it. Yes, et voila, here. Good. And uh, we haven't suspended the ovary here because the, we, we actually have a straight needle to do it but our patient is a bit uh, of a high BMI. So this is why we will, here we sealed, and then two millimeters out and one millimeter up and we go. And again, if I give this to Arvin, yes, Arvin, if you kindly hold here, perfect. Remember that these instruments have a blade, which is this one, this one, that is moving very, 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 and I don't know how many, how many thousands of seconds, how many thousands of rounds per second, a lot. <clears throat> so I will show you one thing. Now I'm seeing it. And look. Okay. But if I'm doing this, can you see? 
when you seal and cut, and this is something that I learned from my friend Shaheen. He has shown me this before. And uh, yes, again, why am I saying this? Because look, it's not working, but it is very hot. If you're not aware about this, you might use this also to cut, but at the same time to dissect. And if you use it to dissect, what will happen is uh, if you're not aware that this is the hot blade, you can use it, for example, near the ureter here. And if you use it near the ureter here, this is where you can find, uh, you can be in trouble. So we opened the other way, the other side, we opened for endometriosis. Here we will open, we will have a, another approach. So we will keep the ureter on the broad ligament and we will go lateral to the ureter. Lateral to the ureter because we want to develop this plane. And as you can see here, we are just swimming. Mohammed, um, there's a question about distinguishing between the ovarian artery and vein in the case of pelvic congestion. I, mean, I think that's kind of a, a difficult kind of one to kind of uh, talk about, but um, any kind of thoughts on that? Well, over in uterine, I mean, pelvic congestion is a very big topic actually. And uh, here, I'm not sure uh, if if we can yes we can if we can do surgically something for it, my understanding is uh, the best to deal with it is uh, uh, interventional radiology, and uh, I personally find it very difficult when I see patients with pelvic pain and pelvic congestion, because surgically yes fine if I identify the uterine artery and the uterine vein, what should I do? And uh, this is why I personally don't believe that coagulating the uterine vein would help this patient. I'm not sure. I'm not aware about the strong evidence to support this. And this is why when it is diagnosed, my advice always is uh, to have uh, a discussion with an interventional radiologist uh, and maybe this patient would benefit from something like that. Okay, here we moved in a sort of oncological approach endometriosis as you have seen we open medially oncology we open laterally most of the time so here we're keeping the ureter here and we open lateral to the ureter and as you can see parallel parallel and parallel and we went on and here we the first structure that crosses and again this is my friend Shalish Kuntambekar that taught me this that yes, the first organ that crosses from lateral to medial above the ureter is the uterine arc. Yes, it's a big hole. Yes, we can open directly. Yes, we can dig a hole. I don't think this is the best thing to do, but there are different ways of doing it. I, there is no right or wrong. I personally prefer dissecting, especially because when doing uh, uh, most of the work I do is for endometriosis. And this is why, as you can see here, this is the uterine artery of the origin. And if I want to do it, I can do it here at that level. And I can see very well where I am. Okay. Mohammed, can yes. you just also briefly just tell us about the surgical technique that you use of kind of using one hand, pushing away the tissue, because people will be obviously concerned about causing collateral damage. So yes. you're using your two hands very nicely to separate those spaces. Perfect, so it is very easy. Here, this is an, an important organ, ureter. We swim, we go parallel, and then we go here. This is not a hot blade. We go here, et voila, we just push. And obviously, if this is a scissor, it's even better. As you can see here, we go swim. It's like swimming. We just open and go here. Okay, this is the uterine artery, and this is again the levels of the lateral parametrium. We haven't finished with the parametrium because I forgot that we haven't spoken. Yes, this is a little bit of endo actually. Looks like here. Yes, yes, yes. So we can dissect this. Can I have the scissors, please? Obviously here, we, I prefer not to use uh, energy devices here and here. Never go in the lesion. 
you go away, 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 and then here you open a healthy plane. I'm aware that we don't have a lot of time remaining, but I just wanted to show you this. No, no, I can show you that again. So in the remaining time, I can see that the, the picture of the phone again, the question. In the remaining time, I would like to first thank everyone who helped this webinar to, to happen. Second, I would like very much to thank again uh, our friends from Medtronic for the fantastic effort that they're doing. As you can see here, this is the right uterosacral ligament. This is the bowel, all adherent to the right uterosacral ligament. We are trying again to separate and to open here. Look, this is the question that you're asking me, Arvin. We go here and we swim. We go, we know this is the right plane. We go and we swim. And then we create another window. And then we swim and so on. And again, very important to have the right amount of counter traction from down below as well. Your second assistant really facilitating this. And if you're struggling, it's probably generally because you're not getting the right amount of traction. Without a doubt. And then, here you go. So here we have a very thick in uterosacral ligament. And if we open here again, we will find again what we were saying there. So we will find here fascia properecti and prehypogastric fascia, hypogastric nerves. And if we go again here to see, this is the ureter, this is the pararectal space, this is the medial pararectal space, and this is the, the lateral. Yes, we, we open here the lateral first because again, we try to do it a bit differently from that side. This is the ureter kept here. This is the uterine artery at the origin. We all already sealed it and cut it. This is the latter part. Yes, posterior parametrium is actually formed of three parts. One, one part is the uterosacral ligament, rectovaginal ligament, and lateral rectal ligaments at that point. Mohammed, you spoke about a very important structure, and is that what you're referring to, the lateral rectal ligaments? Yes. Just there. Also because here, I'm sure that my colorectal colleagues will like what I will say now. <laughs> this is, uh, again, as we said, the nerves penetrate the prehypogastric fascia and go here. So if you can save this, if uh, this, this, again, with using, even with removal of the uterosacral ligament endometriosis, sometimes you can denervate the bladder. And there is a, a very nice article in 2007 by Lubernat who said this, that if you remove, especially if you remove both uterosacral ligaments, why? Because as you can see here, it's not as far as you imagine. Uterosacral ligament here, and this is the fibrous part of it, and the nerves are very close. So if you don't know, or if you don't know where to start or when to end, you can just take a big cut here and you find yourself removing the uterosacral, yes, but removing also a big part of the pelvic innervation, especially if you do it on both sides. The anterior parametrium, we haven't dissected it, and I'm, I'm sorry. The anterior parametrium is also formed of two parts, and uh, one part is, uh, can you please hold this for me? Yes, again here. To dissect the anterior parametrium, we need to go here. We need to go to this. We dissect the bladder significantly, and then we go here, and we go here, and we go here, and this is, we are not dissecting the bladder because we will need to do some injections here. However, this is a space, the space of Morro, where we will find here, yes. And then you find two parts of the anterior parametrium with the entry of the ureter and the bladder. This part, ventral and medial. This part, posterior and lateral. This part is okay to clip and cut because it's usually vascular. This part, please don't touch because if you're doing a nurse pairing surgery, this is not something to, to play with. So again, this is a, the anterior parametrium. I mean, I'm just trying to dissect the ureter till it's entry in the bladder. Um, there was a question about some bleeding and if you encounter venous bleeding around here and then presumably it's the usual uh, things uh, in terms of situational awareness, using swabs, um, hemostats. Yes. 
uh, some pressure initially while you get your bearings. Yes, um, absolutely. So here we, we definitely try to, uh, if there is a little bit of venous bleeding, I, I love compression and wait and see. And then if we can do this, can you please posteriorize the, the hemostatic agents are very good and we like them as well. And, uh, but yes, obviously it's better to avoid. <laughs> yes. Especially in this area. Yes. I mean, there was mention of the corona mortis, uh, and as the name would suggest, you're, you're really yes. struggling at that stage. So yes. uh, again, thinking on your feet very much about the pressure, as you mentioned, there are uh, hemostatic agents um, that, that we use as well yes. uh, that are, are effective. Um, various set tends to be a good pad that you can use you, applying some pressure to diffuse areas. Good. So here, as you can see, this is That's very nice. Though. Yes, the, almost the entry of the ureter at the bladder. And again, here, this can be the superior vesicle artery for the colleague who was asking about it. Uh, we will cut it, and then we will have here nice. the entry of the. So this part, this part that is medial. And ventral, yes, you can take it with your hysterectomy, radical hysterectomy to the ureter. This part, if you're doing a nerve sparing surgery that is posterior and lateral to the ureter, contains the distal parts of the nerves that are uh, innervating the bladder. And uh, this is absolutely something to conserve if you're doing a nerve sparing surgery. So, I would question do, do, do you ever. Um wet your swab with vasopressin first. Um, I, I've certainly not heard of that, but um, sounds intriguing. I, I don't actually, but if, if I need to wet them with something, maybe, I, I have never been in a situation where I have to wet them with, uh, uh, but I know that some colleagues wet the swabs with tranexamic acid, but I'm, I'm, I'm not actually sure if this is something that is, uh, has an evidence or not, but yes, either I use a swab in a compression or I use a hemostatic agent, and uh, yes, I think at that point, again, we, I just would like to, uh, we, we're closing? Yes. So uh, again, I would like to thank my colleague Arvind, Sharif, Chris. I'd like to thank Matt Pronik. I would like to thank you all for being here and for your interest in uh, sharing the passion of anatomy and uh, the uh, retroperitoneum. I would like very much to thank the guys here in the Griffin Institute. And I would like to invite you all to the, our second uh, 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 round of uh, endometriosis learning pathway. We will start the applications very soon. And uh, the, uh, the endometriosis learning pathway is uh, one academic year. First is, uh, 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 why don't you explain it? Fine, okay, Nile. Nile will explain for you all the uh, details about the, uh, Please. Yes, thanks, Mohammed. Yes, so as Mohammed was saying, we are beginning to take applications starting today. So after the webinar, I will send you all the details that you need to start your submission process. So just to briefly go over the structure, we'll have a digital masterclass at the start that takes place over five months. We'll then have a cadaver lab, which we completed today for this year's module and was very successful. Tomorrow, then we want to do a clinical immersion, and we will do that next year also. And then finally, we will have digital proctorships where you will get to submit your cases and the faculty will review them and provide guidance on them. So that's it from our side, from Medtronic's perspective. Again, thank you to Arvind and thank you to Mohammed. Really interesting dissection. Um, there was many, many questions coming in and you did a great job to, to balance all of them and, and to get through the dissection. So thanks a million, thanks Mohammed and thanks thank Arvind. Thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Everyone. thanks everyone. Okay, good one. Great. I will see you connected. You need to talk to